Today is December 8, 2017, and I am interviewing Lonnie Wells in Taylorville, Illinois. Um, Lonnie, you are 37 years old, is that correct? 38. 38. Having, you were born on November 17, 1979. Yes. Okay, so 38 years old. My name is Sue Burkholder, and I'll be the interviewer. And Lonnie, for the recording, would you please state um, uh, what war in which you served in the branch of service? I was overseas uh, in Iraq when I was stationed at Fort Hood in the U.S. Army. Okay. Well, let's start with a little bit about your um, where you were born and you know a little bit about your family, parents, any siblings, that type of thing. Okay. Um, I was born in Mattoon, Illinois, at Sarah Bush Lincoln Health Center. Um, my father was Lowell Wells, uh, my mother's Peggy Sims. I have three half brothers and one half sister. I'm the only child between my parents. And were there any other of your uh, family that entered the military? No, well, my brother did. Uh, he ended up getting a dishonorable discharge for partying too much. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, what were your parents' occupations? Uh, my dad, he worked at Blonox. Uh, he was a plasma burner. He cut the steel to make pavers for the roads. And my mother worked at r, &R Donnelly's. Uh, it's a paper company where they make magazines and inserts and stuff like that. Okay. And what were you doing before you entered the service? I was in high school at Cumberland County High, high School. Okay. And what, um, uh, you enlisted? Yes. Uh, obviously there hasn't been a draft for a while, <laughs> so you enlisted. And why did you enlist and why did you choose the Army? Um, I enlisted mainly to get away. Um, I didn't see any potential in my life going anywhere if I stayed in the area I was at. So I wanted to have the opportunity to advance into something a little bit more better, a little bit better. And who introduced you to the, the idea of going into the military? Or how did that come about? It was mainly just an idea that popped in my head one day. Um, I, I initially was going to enlist in the Marines. And after taking a little time and researching a little, uh, I chose the Army instead. All right, so where did you go then for basic training? I went to basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia. Okay. And what was your first impression when you arrived? It was hot. <laughs> um, after living in Illinois for so long, it's Georgia's a little, little warmer. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, those first few days, what was it like with um, your drill instructors and, and and meeting a whole uh, large group of new people? Honestly, back then, it was, I was very nervous. Um, it's the first time I had been away from my family, my area, and being surrounded by people that are in your face, yelling at you, telling you what to do, and you have no clue what's going on. Um, it, it definitely was an eye-opening experience. And what about the, the people who were there with you? Did you make friends pretty fast? Um, not really. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of a quiet person. I usually tend to stick to myself. Mm -hmm. After a while, there was a small group of us that started talking, and I ended up getting their addresses and staying in touch with them, uh, the ones that I went through basic training with. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, it's... It was definitely different being surrounded by all different ethnics and types of people and different attitudes and opinions. And yeah. um, in basic training, um, how did you adjust to, um, you know, staying with, again, a large group of people um, in your, were you in barracks? Yes, we were in a dorm type barracks. Dorm type barracks. Yes. So were you in rooms or was it a large open area? It was a large open area. And how was how did you adjust to that? That was very weird at first. Um, getting to where you 
had to trust a bunch of people basically living in one big bedroom mm -hmm. and definitely the hardest part for me was the showers uh, everybody wanted to take a shower and you know if you're not used to being naked surrounded by a bunch of people you don't know it, it was definitely awkward mm -hmm. okay and um I'm sure they fed you very well to yes. keep you going. Did was that good for you? Did you enjoy the food or uh, the food was actually really good. And when I joined the military, I was only 194 pounds. So after going through basic and you know their food, uh, my favorite was the mornings. I always had the waffles with um, syrup and peanut butter. So mm -hmm. I, I had a lot of protein and packed on weight pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Um, after I went through basic training, I went from 194 pounds to 246 pounds. So I, I packed on a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we were working out every day, all day, it seemed like. And uh, running was definitely not my favorite thing, but it's something I had to get used to. Uh, are there any of the instructors that you feel um, either were memorable for one reason or another or that made an impact on your life while you were in basic training? Uh, Drill Sergeant Gibson. I I don't know why. Um, he just seemed to like me from the get-go and mm -hmm. I mean he, I, he he'll always stand out. I mean I remember all my drill sergeants but he's, he was my favorite mm -hmm. and um, it was probably Three weeks before graduating, he actually got uh, signed to become a master sergeant instead of being the E7. So he went from being a drill sergeant to a master sergeant. So he wasn't there for my graduation, which for me kind of stunk, but I understood. <laughs> Let's see. Um, so after basic training, you you went on to advanced training? Yes. Okay, and can you tell me about that? Um, my advanced training, I was a 31 FOX, which is a network switching systems operator maintainer. Um, the easiest way I can describe it is basically like AT&T on the back of a Humvee. Mm -hmm. um, you set up all communications from the field or overseas to back home. So uh, when you were done with advanced training, then where did you go? I went to Fort Jackson briefly. Um, I was only at Fort Jackson for probably a month before I got my permanent duty station at Fort Hood, Texas. So what was a, what was a day in the life of um, Lonnie Wells at your duty station? Um, well, basically, uh, a lot of the times we had free time, so since I was issued my own Humvee, we would go to the motor pool and I'd, we'd sign them out and either take them off-road and, you know, just play around and uh, we'd take them down the old tank trails, see if we could get them stuck. <laughs> but um, other than that, as long as we had them cleaned and everything was good on them when we returned them, we were all right. Um, I can say one of my favorite things I loved doing was when I was shooting my M16. My, uh, I remember back in basic, my drill sergeant, it was Drill Sergeant Gibson, he uh, let everybody know to save our ammunition and don't shoot the 300 meter targets because most of the time you'll miss them anyway. And as I was shooting, I was hitting every target and he was standing behind me and when the 300 popped up, he said, Wells, are you going to shoot? And right when he said that, I pulled the trigger and it fell. And I was like, yes, drill sergeant. And after qualifying, I ended up getting expert because I hit all my targets. Um, he actually let me keep one of my targets to, as a keepsake. And the entire middle, the star in the middle was gone. So I, I was fairly decent at that. I loved it. Of course, coming from a background where I hunted all the time, I was familiar with weapons, and I can I can use them fairly efficiently. And uh, what did you do? Uh, well, besides off-roading with the Humvee, what did you do for 
just relaxation time or um, in the evenings when you were or when you were off duty? Um, when I was off duty, I found that I got bored a lot, so I ended up getting a second job. I was a bouncer at a nightclub just outside of Fort Hood, Texas. Um, the club was called uh, Oz. It was Oz. Um, it was around, oh, there was probably five clubs in the area, and um, my uh, sergeant actually took me out to lunch. and. He took me to a place called Teasers, which was a strip club. And as soon as I walked in, the manager asked me if I wanted to become a bouncer. So it was my first time ever in a strip club. So I ended up accepting it and becoming, I was a bouncer at the strip club for probably two months before I moved from Teasers to Oz. And Oz was more of a dance club and I, I liked the move a lot better because I got tired of all the drama from the people in in the strip club. <laughs> I, being the bouncer at Oz was probably the, my most favorite thing I've done work-wise. Uh, after being in the military all day, it seemed like that was my real like, my release. Um, any frustrations or anything I had was. It was a good release to take out on people fighting and stuff like that. I could, I became friends with most of the local cops because they would show up, and um, it, it was it was something I, I enjoyed a lot. So um, during your day job, and I know you're limited on what you can say, but what can you tell us about how that what you did during the day? Um, it, it is something, it's a, it's a very classified field. Um, one thing I can say is I, I always, I became the squad leader. Um, I was actually put in charge of people that outranked me because my captain knew at the time that if there was a job that needed done, just tell me what to do and leave me alone. And I made sure everything was done. I, I didn't order people around. I worked next to them. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't the kind of person that, I guess, let power go to their head. Um, one thing I used to get talked to about, I never got in trouble for physic or like on paper, but when we were overseas, um, the troops that were in my area, I, w I allowed them to call home. Now, we weren't allowed to do that because it was supposed to be, you know, meant for, you know, missions and communications. So I figured if I could call home, they can call home, which, in my opinion, increased their morale and made them a lot happier. So how long were you at, um, see, where are you at now, Fort? Um, I was at Fort Hood. Fort Hood, okay. How long were you there? I was at Fort Hood for most of my duration. Um, I would say about three and a half years. Okay. And then um, at some point you were deployed? Yes. And tell me about that. Um, when I was deployed, we actually had to turn in all of our uniforms. Um, we had the, you know, basic green cargo pants and it was before the digital pants that are out now and we had to turn in our green for sand mm -hmm. our sand BDUs so that was a, a different experience uh, before we deployed we um, I was put on a detail of getting all the all of our vehicles painted because obviously they were green camouflage and that would stand out in the desert so we uh, we had to use cart paint, and I was probably on that detail for two months. Uh, every morning, instead of having to show up at the barracks and you know do all that stuff, I just went straight to the paint booth, and we had a small team that took care of the painting. I, my sergeant actually put me in charge there as well, mainly because I was too big to fit in the paint uniform. <laughs> So, so I was in charge of keeping the vehicles in order of what needed paint and who showed up with 
you know, what vehicles. And the best part that I liked about that detail was I was allowed to drive almost every vehicle the military has except the M181. Uh, the M1A1 I wasn't allowed to drive because it had a special license because it had a turbine engine. The rest of them were diesel engines. So uh, the Bradley, I got to drive it. My, my favorite thing to drive was probably the little M113, the little uh, medic tank or, you know, personnel tank. And there was two different kinds. They had the joystick kind and then the hourglass uh, steering wheel kind. And for me, it was just a lot of fun to drive. Um, they weren't real fast, but it, it, was, it was neat. Being in the Bradley was something different, being surrounded by all the steel and guns and it was it was definitely a fun experience I, I love driving all the different vehicles um, I got to drive a Fox one time which it's what the MPs drove around it was the armored submergible 6x6 six six vehicle so it, it was definitely interesting the coolest thing that I saw that showed up there I, I never got to drive was the um, I forgot what they called it, but it was like a tank and a bridge. Um, whenever you, you know, you came across like a river or something, the, this bridge folded out so the vehicles could drive over, and that showed up to be painted. And that was probably the neatest thing that I had seen. I didn't even know the military offered anything like that. Um, they also had a trailer there that. I bet it had 40 tires on it, and it was for hauling around the tanks, you know, when we pulled them down the road, and each axle turned independently, which was kind of neat because every, each wheel turned, <laughs> so it, it was it was definitely something to see too, you had to get used to driving it, I, I didn't, I wasn't allowed to drive it either, but it, it would have been probably kind of complicated. <laughs> Sounds like it. Um, so, so when you're done prepping and your unit's ready to go, you're deployed. Yes. And so, tell me about that. Um, we well, we basically got everything ready. Um, showed up with our new sand uniform, our sand BDUs. Uh, we loaded up in a cargo plane, the military cargo plane, and flew over. Um, basically when we landed it, it was since I was in Texas it was, it was fairly hot anyway um, the weather over there was similar to Texas a little warmer but it was it was definitely different now, there was a lot of a lot of sand and being surrounded by people that you knew didn't trust you and didn't want you there in the first place I mean you, you, you definitely don't feel welcome at all. <laughs> so your interaction with the locals was um, not the most positive experience? No. Okay. No, they didn't trust you, didn't want you around. Um, I know when we first showed up, we were wearing sunglasses. And... To my understanding by the interpreter, which I still, it doesn't really make sense, but he said that the reason, like they don't trust, they didn't trust us with sunglasses on because it's like we could see through their clothing or something. And they thought that that's why we were wearing sunglasses. So again, I don't know if he was just pulling my leg or what. Um, I, I didn't know or even comprehend any of the language. I caught on to a very little bit, but yeah, it's been so long I don't remember half of it either. <laughs> yeah. And what was it like, um, like uh, your, uh, what you did during the day and then at night sleeping in the desert, um, were you in tents in a building? Uh, we were in tents. Okay. We, we set up tents. Um, sleeping at first was really difficult. Um, obviously because you're in a strange place you're surrounded by people you know want to kill you <laughs> um, 
I think it, it got more along the point of you were so exhausted you slept instead of you know actually ever being comfortable in sleeping. Um, I know a lot of our downtime that was over there, we spent either having a drink or playing cards or sometimes we weren't really supposed to. We would catch like the, um, what are they called? The, uh, what are they called? We would catch a scorpion and the spider, but it was, uh, I think it was the, the sand spiders. They were the big ones. And we would watch them to um, like we would we'd watch him fight to see basically who was going to win and who was going to lose most of the time the scorpion actually beat the spider so uh, we basically did anything we could to kill the time I didn't have any kids or anything at that point so I mean I didn't really have anything making me miss home too much um, I would call my mom every once in a while and my dad and I we didn't hardly talk at all so was the sand pretty invasive in every part of your life oh it was everywhere um, when the wind would pick up they had the sandstorms you basically had to be indoors or you would find it in places it shouldn't be mm -hmm. I mean sand found its way into every crevice no matter how small it was mm -hmm. Uh, we were constantly having to clean our equipment, constantly having to take apart our, our weapons and making sure they were clean and operational. And mm -hmm. it, it, it was definitely a pain. Um, the the windstorms there were ridiculous. I mean, you wouldn't think it, but it would blow an insane amount of sand everywhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. It would just be like a wall of sand hit you. <laughs> So, um, did you um, w did you actually go out into combat, or were you more just yes. support or how, how? Tell me about that. Um, yes, we we I went out in combat with a small team. I actually had a friend of mine that I stuck with sometimes. Since I was in communications, I had my own radio pack. Um, he he was in the canine unit, so he had the bomb dog. Um, he would, you know, when we were checking houses, I was well, most of the time close to the last person to go in since my job was, wasn't really combat. It was more, well, it was communications. But he would send the dog in basically to see if there were any, is any bombs or anything around. And... I remember one day we sent it into the house and the dog ended up getting shot, which I thought it was going to be the end of his world. I mean, when when you have an animal you train with every single day, he developed an, an attachment that was amazing. <laughs> um, when the dog died, he basically had to go home over it because he couldn't get past it. So did you, I mean, in those times that y you were in combat and um, out, did you um, did you lose any of your teammates or? Um, uh, yes, we were fired upon uh, a few times. There was one time I was fired upon. We were in a group. Um, the only thing we remember is getting shot at. We all took off running and when I stopped running, I just kind of fell over. I didn't know what happened. I ended up taking a gunshot or a ricochet or something to my leg. I had a pretty good sized hole and my BDUs were torn and there was blood everywhere. I, I didn't at first understand why I couldn't stand up until I saw the blood. Okay. But um, I guess it was the adrenaline that allowed me to, to run away from the scene until it slowed down. I was, I was done. <laughs> Um, I ended up getting it taken care of when, and then I was shipped back over here for uh, medical reasons. Hmm. Let's see. So,
Do you have, I mean, have you ever thought about how today's, like the wars and the skirmishes that you were in, differ from, you know, wars in the past, uh, some of the older wars, even like Vietnam and, and on back? Do you, I mean, did you ever think about how they were different and how differently you were equipped and that type of thing? Um, yes, and to me, being over in Iraq was con confusing, mainly. I don't understand why we went in the first place. Um, I know it was basically based over oil, but I, I know wars in the past, like when we went to Korea, we set up a post and I mean it was we we took over and took charge. It seems like now we're over there. We act like we're going to take over and then we back out. And then, you know, they get strong and then we act like we're going to take over and we back out. I, I don't understand the the concept of what's going on today. Um I know years ago it was more of you know a power thing. You know, you went over, you took over, you put in a list of rules, and people had to basically abide by them. And again, like I said, it seems like now we, we go in and we take over, and then we walk away. And I, I don't understand why. <laughs> Not a purpose? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, to me it seemed like the whole purpose was based on money. You know, it was based on oil, and we lost a lot of people's lives for money. And to me, that doesn't seem like a sufficient amount or a sufficient enough reason to go over there. Well, so um, you went back. Did you go back to Fort Hood? Yes. Okay. And how did, um, as you were wrapping up your um, military career, how did, um, what were you doing as you were? getting ready to leave the military? Um, by the time I made it back, it was mainly I got healed up and then it was time for me to out process. Um, my duty time was done. Mm -hmm. uh, by that time, the girl that I had met when I was a bouncer, um, she was pregnant. So it was, you know, I was going to be a father. Mm -hmm. um, to me, being a father was more important than being in the military. So instead of reenlisting, I went home. Mm -hmm. I uh, I wanted to be a full time dad. You know, I wanted to be there twenty four seven. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be a dad that was gone for six months or a year or two years because of you know going overseas. I wanted I wanted him to know who I was every day. Yeah. Okay, so you've uh, returned home. What did you do? When you returned home? Um, at first, my my wife, she uh, she couldn't hardly sleep with me because any movement, any sound, she used to say all she had to do was raise her head off the pillow and I was awake. I was ready to go. And it, it, it was definitely a process that had to, it took a long time to adapt back into. Um, The biggest problem I think I had was stuff I had seen. Um, it, it's hard to, at the time it, it, when I was in the military, it was justified because I was doing my job. Mm -hmm. After you get out of the military, you have time to think. <laughs> mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. some of the stuff that I did and some of the stuff that I seen, to me, there's no justica justification for it. Hmm. So, um, how do you feel like the, your military experiences affected your life? Um, for the main part, basic training, but surprisingly, was the part that I loved the most. Mm -hmm. I loved structure. I loved having my life, or not really my life, my day planned. Mm -hmm. You know, I woke up, I knew what I was doing. Um, I definitely took that home with me. Uh, my house, if you walk into it, it's everything is neat in, in, in its place. I mean, there's, there's a place for everything. 
so I I definitely took the, the structure home um, with my kids I, I have a boy and a girl and I'm a real relaxed laid-back dad but my kids are very honest and respectful and that's one thing that I love um, to me it seems like you know a lot of kids don't know what morals or respect is and my, my son will stop and open the door for you I, he'll hold the door for you he'll say please and thank you yes sir yes ma'am I mean he, he's a very good kid mm -hmm. and my little girl she's six now she's starting to get into the same way I mean you know if you're there every day and you know you try to teach them the right things they they learn the right things so if you could name one thing, what was the most positive thing that you took away from your experience in the service? Hmm. I would say the discipline. Um, like I said, I got to the point where even in everyday life now, I like having everything planned out. Mm -hmm. I like knowing what I'm doing from wake up to sleep. Mm -hmm. You know, at the time, like, uh, see, when I, when I graduated AIT, uh, my job, we had, we were allowed our, fur, our free time, and we had to fill out an itinerary, basically how many hours we're driving, you know, where we're going to stop, where we're going to sleep, and, and at the time I thought that it was such a pain in the butt and now i mean it's something i do anyway if i choose or if i decide to go on vacation i basically do the exact same thing so it's uh, it, it something i got used to um i i love the discipline and structure mainly um is there anything that if you would say that would speak to um any of future generations that might listen or watch your um the video of your interview is there anything you would say to them I would say that I honestly believe that the draft should be back in effect I, I think every child male female should go through the military just to learn discipline learn respect mm -hmm. values mm -hmm. there's one thing that I learned that I kept with me and it was an acronym leadership, L-D-R-S-H-I-P. And it was loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. And that's something that was drilled into me and it's something I try to live by. Well, I wanna thank you so much for your time, uh, talking to us, talking to me, and thank you very much for your service to our country. Thank you.